uh, delighted to uh, bring to you today um, Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger, who is the chairman of University London College, University College London Hospitals NHS uh, Foundation Trust, uh, and has a career steeped in um, interest in in medicine, medical ethics, and uh, leadership, and indeed politics, which is everything that we're all uh, interested in. Um, Julia, do you mind me calling you Julia? Julia. I would be delighted for you to call me <coughs> Julia. I can't Thank you, think right. of you calling me anything else, really. That's, that's, that's very kind of you. Julia, tell us about your early life, your early years. Um, to, how, how, did, how did you come to even get involved in, uh, in rabbinic work? Okay, so it's all, um, and people will always say that women say their careers are an accident and men say they planned it, but mine really is an accident. I was... Um, I went to Cambridge to do Assyriology, which is Babylonian. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I've been fascinated by Babylonian things since being quite a small child. You know how lots of children get to get fascinated by mummies. I was fascinated by all those sort of lions with wings that you can see at the British Museum. And um, I was at Cambridge doing Assyriology. Uh, I did Hebrew. You have to do another language. So I did Hebrew as my second language because I already knew some. And um, I applied to go and dig in Iraq in 1969. There had been hangings of Jews in Baghdad and Basra in 1968 and 1969. And the Iraqi authorities weren't keen for me to come. And then I, I, I don't like people saying no to me. So I made a fuss and then they let me in. And then the British school um, in Iraq with whom I was going to be digging uh, said that they didn't think it was really very safe for either me or them. So that was that. The following year, I applied to go and dig with the British school in Ankara in Turkey. And uh, from 1970, for a while, British archaeologists were stopped from digging in Turkey because there was a scandal because a British archaeologist was suspected of stealing finds off a site. Some people who are old enough will remember the Dorak affair. Anyway, I was British and Jewish with no great future in ancient Near Eastern archaeology. And I changed to do Hebrew as my main subject for the second part of my degree, thinking I'd be an academic. And then somebody who was teaching me said I should think about becoming a rabbi. And at that stage, I was sort of thinking, well, this is ridiculous and women aren't rabbis. But anyway, in my last year at Cambridge, I went to London one day a week uh, to study with the greatest scholar that Jewish scholar that Britain has ever produced, somebody called Rabbi Dr. Louis, Louis Jacobs, who taught Talmud. Uh, and I was completely hooked. And that's how I got into it. But even then, I thought I was going to be an academic. So it was later I became a pastoral rabbi. So, so as, a, as, a, as a young girl, I mean, was it watching Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or something that, that turned you on to um, the Assyriology? And I like that. That's uh, no. slightly un, un, unusual. No, it's weirder than that. My father's closest friend was somebody called Richard Barnett, who was keeper of Western Asiac Asiatic antiquities at the British Museum and in those days the keepers had to spend um, two weekends a year I think in residence in the museum so as a child I was allowed to run free amongst all the Assyrian um, you know the, the kind of the, the war carvings and the great huge carvings and I just became fascinated and it was particularly sort of things about you know what had happened um, in the city of Ur and the kind of board games you can see that they were playing in you know 18, 1800 BCE um, yeah I just got hooked I think and, children and... do Children do on mummies or dinosaurs or whatever. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. And tell me, so in terms of uh, of Yiddishkeit, Jewishness, did, was your was your family home uh, a very religious home? Or, or no, my father was. My father had been had grown up Orthodox and had left um, Orthodox Judaism and become a Reform Jew uh, before I was born. My mother was a bit allergic to anything sort of synagogue like but she was a German Jewish refugee she'd come to this country in 1937 so it was certainly a religiously observant but non-orthodox home that I grew up in uh, and I certainly had lots of sort of you know festivals with my entire extended family mostly at my grandmother's house so yeah I mean I had a pretty Jewish upbringing. And, and becoming a, um, a rabbi uh, at the time you did I believe you were the second ever lady rabbi in in the uh, United Kingdom was a very unusual. I mean, we hear the same in terms of other religions accepting uh, senior leaders uh, who, are, who are women. 
um, how, 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 friends, how does your family take that and, and your friends? What do they think of you going into what was at the time a 100% male world? Well, my friends were all very supportive um, because they just thought this was a great thing. And of course, it's, it was a time when, you know, women were, if you like, bashing away at things that were seen as very male preserved. You know, I became a, uh, I, I became a rabbi in 1977. I started my rabbinic training in 1973. So it, that, everybody was just, you know, go for it, go for it. I mean, that's Jewish and non-Jewish friends alike. My father was much more ambivalent. My mother just said, oh, do whatever you want, but I can't think why you should want to do it. But... My father was much more ambivalent about women um, in, you know, women becoming rabbis. And my my orthodox uncle was extremely ambivalent about it. But, you know, in the end, they just went along with it. And, and at what point in that process did you uh, get married? Was that before or after you were ordained? I got married just before I went to just before I went to rabbinic college. I got married in 1973. Because I, I believe that nearly, nearly fifty years. Oh wow! <clears throat> Everyone deserves a medal. For, I'm thirty-one years. Um, yeah. I will say the yeah, first yeah. thirty were difficult, but so yeah. um, I believe that rabbis have to be married in order to be ordained. Is that is that true? No, 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 no. That wasn't tr wasn't true then, and certainly isn't true now. And of course, this was all, all, long before sort of uh, we had lots of gay rabbis. We have lots of gay rabbis, some of whom are married, some of whom aren't. No, no, definitely don't have to be rabbi. Uh, don't have to be married to be a rabbi. Certainly not in the not in, in in reform or liberal Judaism. And, and then move, moving forward in, in your extraordinary uh, life so far. I mean, so so from what I can see from reading about you is, is there's the there's a side where you went into politics and there's a side where you went into healthcare and medical ethics were they separate or or, or the same stream as far as you're concerned i think they've all i think they've always intertwined to some extent so i got i got involved really in healthcare uh, in, indirectly through through being a, a pastor or a congregational rabbi and visiting lots of members of my congregation in different hospitals. So at first I was a rabbi at South London Liberal Synagogue in Streatham and my congregation specialised in being ill and there were an awful lot of hospitals around. So, you know, I was going to St Thomas's or to Guy's or St George's or in those days St James's in, in Ballam, uh, lots and lots of Kings, lots and lots of different hospitals. And when some some of my members were having more complicated things wrong with them sometimes you know um doctors would ask me what i thought about a particular thing ethically life support being a very good example yeah. of that actually whether you could switch off life support uh, this was a, a time when the then chief rabbi emmanuel jacobovitz took the line that you couldn't ever switch off life support uh, because that was effectively killing somebody. Um, and so I got involved in that all quite indirectly through being a pastoral rabbi. And then because of that, I was asked first to be on the Royal College of Nursing's Ethics Committee and later the BMA's Ethics Committee, all through connections because I'd been in different hospitals. And that began a much longer process of being involved in a whole lot of as it were, healthcare, medical and nursing institutions. So the RCN particularly, but also a bit the BMA. I was on the GMC uh, and quite involved in a whole, whole lot of things in the GM, GMC, particularly some of the reform of things around accreditation. Um, and so and that's how I got into it. And that's quite political. It's small p political. Yeah. And so that really, some of that fired me up to be get more interested in politics more generally, um, I had grown up in the Labour Party. My parents were quite keen Labour supporters. My mother had been a communist in Germany before the war. My father was a civil servant, so couldn't be active politically, but I think would have liked to have been. And so um, I was involved in Labour student politics at university. And then I was very angry with Labour over East African Asians, as it happens. And then when the SDP was formed, in 1981, I was invited by Shirley Williams to be one of the first, you know, on the list of 100 supporters of the SDP. So I got back in. Fascinating. And and tell me, so within Judaism, I have a limited knowledge of being Jewish myself. There's there's enormous discussion in in the in the uh, uh, the Talmudic works, the, the 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 basis behind religion on ethics and on. Um, Things like, as, you, as you've alluded to, um, end of life, 
um, and whether whether you can prolong life or whether it's life at, at, at all costs. Did you find reading those tracts help you in your formulating your views on uh, on, on end of life care and other important issues? Yes, no. I mean, yes, because I think it helps you to think quite systematically because that is a systematic way of thinking, although the, the premise behind it is that you must preserve life at all costs, whereas uh, although the beginning of life is quite different from how it's viewed in, in particularly in Catholicism, Judaism doesn't regard the fetus as having a status in the same way. But um, obviously that is, you know, Orthodox Judaism doesn't accept that this is time bound. It's all, if you like, discussion of its time and place. But if you're not Orthodox and you regard this as having been written by human beings trying to interpret what God wanted in their day, then you have to say, OK, in terms of modern knowledge, uh, we know that, you know, if you simply extend life ad infinitum, you're not doing anybody a favour. You're certainly not doing the patient a favour because it's may be very unpleasant and they anyway don't know anything about it in so far as we know but it's not a sensible use of resources when you actually would want to use that kind of life support to support somebody who has a chance of getting better and so right. i think what it does is it, in, it encourages you to think systematically but unless you're going to absolutely stick with the view that is essentially a a fifth or sixth or century or medieval view, you would have to say, and then you take modern scientific knowledge into account. That was written by human beings, male human beings in their day. Scientific progress has been made in lots of different ways. It also sometimes makes terrible mistakes, but you have to use all the different ways of thinking that you can and all of modern knowledge that you can in order to tease out what the right thing to do is. And one of one of the most well known uh, areas where you got involved was, was the was the Liverpool Care Pathway, which was I was brought up with as a medical student and as a as a junior doctor. Um, was 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 looking into that and, and your eventual um, the outcome was that controversial? Did you have a lot of pushback on it, or was it something that everyone agreed had become out of date and needed to be uh, revamped? It was a really difficult thing to take on because, well, for a variety of reasons. By the time I took it on, government had already, you know, they tried to do an internal review and that had been pushed back uh, by the press, really. Uh, and so they were kind of and there'd been lots of terrible, terrible press about it. And I think it's really important to say that, that I was using, if you like, the kind of ethical consideration, but also there's a political element to this. One of the reasons there was such pushback by within the press and by lots of kind of patient groups and patient relative groups was that there'd been this sequence system by which if hospitals had used the Liverpool care pathway for patients at the end of life, they actually got a slight a small financial reward. And so therefore, people got very, very worried about, you know, you're paid to be on the, you know, you're paid to put somebody on the Liverpool Care Pathway. And that, I think, was a huge mistake on the part of government. It was a political, small p, and indeed capital P, but small p, political mistake. So when we came in to do the review, uh, one of the things we had to do is say, OK, we have to put that to one side and we have to look at what the review actually said. And you, sorry, what, what the pathway actually said. And then we had to look at the various iterations of the pathway. There'd been 12 by this stage. And there was guidance and there was a guidance checklist, which you may remember, Richard, which was on the front of it, which you could sort of tear off and you had to tick things. Yes, you know, I, I do. Uh, yeah. have you, have you, you remember that. Have you checked whether the, you know, whether the patient has been given any kind of liquid, uh, you, you know, and you could tick and say you've checked. It doesn't mean you've actually given them any. And it was full of things like that. And the thing that was really horrific for all of us, and we were as one on this, uh, the thing was really horrific was that there hadn't actually been a proper evaluation of how it was working, how it was working for patients and families, even though there'd been these various iterations. Right. So m the basis of the Liverpool Care Pathway was really good practice. And, and I have all, you know, every um, 
a, a, lots of praise for the people who developed it in Liverpool. But the way it was developed and the way it was taken by the Department of Health and the way it was used and the way there were sort of financial incentives to put people on it all made it deeply flawed. And talking to families of people who'd been on the Liverpool Care Pathway, going around the country and talking to people was absolutely shattering. People were really, really upset. And it became clear that however good the thinking behind having a pathway that would get end of life care better in the UK, however sensible that was, this wasn't going to work. It had become discredited. We had to say it had to stop. And we had to say to the, you know, the different Royal Colleges, to the various organisations, to hospice, to everybody, stop, think again, look at what your first principles are, but also make sure that you actually do talk to patients themselves if they're able to talk and to families. Don't just assume there's one way of doing this. Yeah, the profession has been known for its uh, uh, arrogance on occasion and, and its lack of actually looking at what the person, uh, uh, that's the whole point of it all, the patient uh, uh, needs. Take you forward. Yeah. What drew you to to hospital leadership? I mean, and and I know I know that you were chief executive of the King's Fund, which is, is obviously a fantastic organisation, think tank for uh, for healthcare. What what then took you into to the position you're in now? Well, I've been I've been um, a, a, a chair of an NHS trust before I went to the King's Fund. I, I I was actually on the same patch. I'm a bit of a retread. I was chair of Camden and Islington Community NHS Trust, if right. you remember that. It's quite a long yes. time ago, back in the 90s, uh, which actually covered quite a lot of the services that are now uh, a small part of UCLH and a much larger part of Whittington Health. And I chair Whittington Health as well. So. Um, I've, you know, a lot of the people around the system are people that I've known for a very long time. David Sloman, uh, now, you know, very, very senior in the NHS, is somebody I gave his first management job to. So, you know, I've been around. I, I was drawn to, if you like, leadership in the NHS through um, some of the ethical discussions and through looking at how doctors and nurses and managers made decisions. I became more and more interested in that. The GMC actually partly was what drove me. And it was as a result of that that people, you know, said, well, you know, are you interested? And, and then invited me to become chair of Camden and Islington. That's how, how that's when it first started. I'd been involved in small things before that. I'd be I'd chaired a, a commission on the NHS for the RCN before that, when in Trevor Clay's time. But th it was that that brought me in. And it's if you're interested in discussions about allocations of resources and how, you know, the patients, the service users actually get to, to decide what happens to them, then actually you need to be in the leadership of the NHS because you need to actually help make those decisions. And UCLH is the most extraordinary, wonderful institution, as is Whittington Health. But I really love being able to debate some of those issues with some of the people who are senior and making very important decisions. During COVID, at the beginning of COVID, I was asked by the uh, ICU people at UCLH to, to set up and chair an ethics committee, a practical ethics committee, which we sort of set up within sort of like three days of being asked. And we had our first meeting two days later. It was on Good Fridays, I remember. Um, so that's been a fantastic thing to be able to do and to be allowed to do and, and it's very interesting so as you say you, you you chair a very large um you know very uh, academic uh, teaching hospital in in central london in, in the form of, of, of uch where i've worked since 2005 was the best thing i ever did was to was to move there uh, and you also chair the whittington which is an exceptionally uh, good uh, district general hospital in effect do you notice a huge difference in the, so let's just say, the ethos between the two organisations? Oddly enough, no, but that's partly because they're getting closer together anyway. And because the students, the medical students particularly, uh, you know, will quite likely do a chunk at UCLH and part a chunk at the Whittington. So we see a lot of the same people and we've got increasing numbers of consultants who cover both Whittington Health and UCLH. I mean, in terms of the research base and the absolute drive to be a research based hospital, research driven hospital, which is a UCLA chain. No, the WIT 
doesn't have that in quite the same way. Although some of the services that it provides are absolutely tertiary uh, services. And interestingly, um, things like hospital at home are, are very much led by Whittington Health and that Whittington provides it on behalf of UCLH as well. So <coughs> they are much more linked than one would think, but they are different. You know, UCLH is big. It doesn't feel cosy. Whittington Health does feel quite cosy because actually people know each other a bit more. Um, you get that sense at parts of UCLH. I mean, certainly at Queen Square, the National Hospital, you get a sort of more of a sense of cosiness because people know each other more or Westmoreland Street or whatever. But in the tower, which is pretty huge, you don't quite get that sense. And yet, you know, during COVID, I suppose, and I couldn't go into any clinical area, I must have seen you know an enormous number I don't know hundreds if not thousands of our staff many of them cooling off outside the building uh, having been wrapped in in PPE which is effectively like being wrapped in cling film. No, indeed and and I, I, I was um, as you know I was a governor of UCH myself representing I consultants do know. for, uh, I, that's how I know for a few years so so I, I have first-hand experience of your of your exceptional I have to say uh, leadership uh, skills Julia because the governor's who have quite some power in the organisation were, were, were a very eclectic bunch of, of, of folk, myself in, included. Um, so what I was going to ask you was, just say that you were allowed three um, wishes that would come true of changes that could be made uh, in the NHS. Do you, do you have any idea what they would, for the better, what, 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 would you, what would you change if you could with a snap of your fingers? I think I would, I think I would change um, the, the, the way that we get the sort of adversarial thing that we're seeing now around nurses pay, for instance. I would be I would be looking for a, a, a better relationship, if you like, between gov government and and healthcare staff. I think that's really important. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's going to have to be compromise because there always is. Yeah. But I'd like to see a warmer relationship because I think that's really important. You cannot provide the services the NHS provides without really dedicated staff and we need to recognise those really dedicated staff and so it seems to me that there needs to be a different tone of voice between right. government and if you like the, the staff and at the moment it's nurses but it could be junior doctors actually it could be porters and security guys it doesn't really matter who it is but i want a warmer relationship i think that's really important you know when ministers and secretaries of state come to uch or much more rarely to the whittington to visit what i really want them to do is to say thank you because that's what i think is is seriously important so that'd be one thing i would change yeah and the I, second I, thing i would change go on I was going to say that I, I, I've always thought it's extremely important that, that everybody has a has a high value in 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 trying to help the patients in the hospital, whatever it is they do. And I agree. I think uh, it would be good if the uh, that's a great one. If 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 the the paymasters would be uh, uh, come and understand what 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 folk did in the in the organisation. Sorry, carry on. Your second one. No, I think well they do. I mean they do come and they do come along and look and, and you know they do often say thank you, but I think there just needs to be a different relationship and sometimes you just feel it's hostile and that's not helpful. I know that they haven't got enough money and everybody knows that, but there are other ways of, of play of playing some of this. Sure. And, and you, you need to be you need I think one needs to have less aggression around the system. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I really would give the patients um a greater voice in a whole variety of things. When, if we were going to change something dramatically, we would stop talking about um, staff and senior medical staff, particularly consenting patients as if it was a transitive verb. Actually, what has to happen is patients have to give consent. And for that to happen, and I mean, not only to individual things, but actually patients need to be more involved in the design and understanding of things. And one of the reasons that I think it's been very important having patient experience committees. And one of the reasons I think it's important having governors on particularly quality and safety committee at UCLH is that you kind of need that voice. It needs to be there. And I would like to get rid of the, the, the verb to consent somebody, because I think that would make a huge difference to attitudes and power relationships within our NHS. What would you replace it with? asking people for their consent 
Fair enough. Absolutely. And 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 yes, one more, if you were you were allowed. Uh, okay. And one, one one more. Well, there are loads of other things, but one more I would do because I think it would make people think more. Is I would stop everybody using abbreviations for absolutely everything, yes, particularly yeah. letters of the al alphabet. So you know, we talk about UCLH. Well, that is difficult to say. University College London Hospital all the time. But, you know, quite often in meetings, people talk about all sorts of things with initials and nobody, after they've been there for about three minutes, dares to say, oh, excuse me, what does that stand for? <laughs> and it's terrible, terrible NHS disease. Um, we do now give people a kind of crew sheets of new governors, new, you know, yeah, new yeah. No, I remember. execs. We do give them a crib sheet, but actually... I actually think we need to encourage people not to do that, not because it's so wrong to do it, but because it suggests not only a shorthand in saying it, but sometimes a shorthand in thinking. Uh, it's too uh, obvious. Everybody knows this code and it becomes a secret language. I think that that sounds very and reasonable. I think that's quite dangerous. Uh, I, I, and the other thing that I found in my career is that that some of the uh, abbrevi some of the, the abbreviations mean different things to different people. Uh, so yes, I think you're right. Using that, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, is, is 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 very. I won't give you anything. It's very important. A couple more questions, if you don't mind, uh, Julia. I, I, what I want to ask you, just just sure. what would you what would you most want to be remembered for in a hundred years' time if someone was looking you up on Google? Well, I'd rather hope that you know I, 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 that I won't be remembered by a hundred years from now. You know, you just hope I'll be rotting quietly in Golders Green. But uh, well, by then, by then I'll have rotted. But um, I suppose the things the things I really like to be remembered for. Um, so, in in health terms, uh, actually, the Liverpool Care Pathway is a very very good example. But also around mental health, trying to change the relationship between, if you like, the system and the service users and their families. So I was vice chair uh, of the review of the mental health uh, uh, legislation back in 2018. And I very much hope we're going to get some legislation within the next year or two, um, because I think it's really important to give the, the patients, particularly those who are uh, confined or treated compulsorily uh, without their consent. I think it's really important to give them as much power as you can. So I would hope I'd be remembered for that. So that would be the Liverpool Care Pathway if you like my contribution in in chairing NHS organisations, but uh, in mental health and standing up, uh, you know, in Parliament for people's rights. But I suppose the one I, I, I feel about even more strongly, and that's for family reasons, is standing up for the rights of asylum seekers and trying to argue with this really hostile environment that has been created and saying, actually, you know, we need people in this country who want to come here, who want to do a job of work, who would be really committed and really grateful. This is the wrong way to think about them. This is the wrong way to frame it. It's not that I'm saying we should have unlimited immigration. Plainly, we shouldn't. But I think our attitude has become really horrid. And we have a, a charity, a family charity in memory of both my parents, my, my mother having been a refugee herself, an asylum seeker, and my father's mother having chaired the Welfare Committee, the Refugee Committee in the 1930s and during the war. But we have a family charity to give um, the wherewithal for education for young asylum seekers so that they can get to university because they're not allowed to access student finance. And I really feel strongly about, about that. I'd like to be remembered for somebody who stood up for those who if you like, were powerless and wanted to come here and were fleeing from torture or even from extreme poverty and wanted to make a contribution here. Well, that, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that sounds really great. And, and, and uh, I'm sure that, that in 100 years time, if we ever get the chance to, to see it, that, that, that will be the case. I have one final sort of question or type question for you is, what would you advise a, a young aspiring um, health professional who wants to become a, a, a leader in the health profession? I would advise them to do the best they absolutely can in all aspects of their role, but never, ever forget that it's the patient who is the real beneficiary of all this. And what does the patient want? I think you know, that's absolutely correct. The patient should be put front and uh, foremost uh, in, 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 in all discussions. I mean, that's they are the <laughs> they are the end user. Uh, so uh, no, no, I, I totally, uh, totally, I've come to realise that myself over uh, over many years. Um, Julia, thank thank you so much for taking the time to uh, 
uh, to talk to me. It's been a fascinating um, uh, conversation, and and, I, and I'm really grateful to you. And and in, and in fact, I don't know, you, you are a role model to uh, to me in my in my career. Um, and uh, uh, I I I, uh, I think that the, the the things that you've done and said and achieved are are really uh, extraordinary, and I'm sure they will uh, they will continue. So thank you very much. Well, you're very, very kind and thank you very much and no doubt see you soon. See you soon. Thank you.